My name's Mark Green. I used to work in advertising, so you can trust every word you hear from me. Actually, I loved working in advertising. I loved the work itself. I loved the people. I loved the creativity. And I absolutely adored the lunches. This video consists of two talks. In the first talk, the main course is a discussion of the importance of work and the importance of workplace ministry in God's eyes. In the second, we'll be focusing much more on ministry and evangelism in the workplace. Both talks are accompanied by some nourishing and tasty morsels of wisdom from David Pryor, who's director of the Centre of Marketplace Theology in the City of London, and both will be liberally garnished with some uh, exciting stories of life in the front line at work. First of all, let's take a look at a passage from the Bible. Paul writing to a group of Christians in Colossae. Here's what he says in chapter 3. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for people, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. Now, the context here is not a reference to church work. It's not a reference to evangelism. It's not a reference to preaching. It's not a reference to teaching. It's not a reference to caring for people in the community. It's a clear reference to all forms of work. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. And the Lord God, the King of the universe, would hardly ask us to do whatever we do with all of our hearts, unless it were of some significance to him even if often it's of very little significance to us. Work was not the malicious invention of some divine, sadistic, vicious dictator who was dreaming up some way to make our lives utterly miserable, although maybe sometimes it feels that way. Work was actually given to us before the fall, before Adam and Eve disobeyed. Work was part of the original plan. And as we work, as we see God working, in Genesis 1 we hear God described as creating five times, and we hear God described as working five times. So he creates, he works, he kind of reviews, he appreciates, he says, that's good, and then he finishes, he stops, and he rests. So work is not the result of sin. Work is part of our worship. It's the way that we serve God in the home, in the factory, in the office, as well as in the church. Work is part of our worship of God. The story goes that Ruth Graham, who's married to Billy Graham, has a plaque just above her kitchen sink. And the plaque reads, Divine Services Conducted Here Three Times Daily. How many of us really think that way? As we change a nappy, that overfloweth. As we retype a letter. As we answer the phone to a client that we would rather not talk to this side of the fourth millennium. As we make an arrest. As we do a billion pound deal. As we clip the hedge. Do we really think this is for God? And do we really value all forms of work equally? Certainly our society doesn't. Indeed, one of the saddest phrases you'll hear in Western culture today is this. It's always spoken by a woman. You, you meet a woman at the back of the church, you meet a woman at a party, or in the pub or wherever, and you ask her that most dangerous of questions. You ask her, what do you do? And she says, I'm just a housewife. When you meet the chairman of ICI, he doesn't say, hi, I'm just the chairman of ICI. When you meet the Archbishop of Canterbury, he doesn't say, hi, I'm just the Archbishop of Canterbury, bless you, my child. No, they don't say those things. Anyone who says, I'm just something, is telling you two significant things. First of all, they're telling you that they think that you probably don't think their work is very significant. And secondly, they're telling you that probably they don't think it's very significant either. Our society doesn't value all forms of work equally. And nor, if we're honest, do we in the church. In fact, in the church, we hardly talk about work at all. Now, of course, men do talk about work. How's work, Ed? How's work, Jim? It's what men do. We talk about work. We talk about sport. It's safe ground. But we're not asking each other spiritual questions. We're not asking each other how are we handling our relationship with that boss that we would actually like to hit into the middle of next week. We're not asking ourselves how we're dealing with the fact that we find our secretary knocked down, drop dead, gorgeous and we're already married with 19 children. We're not asking us, uh, you know, each other, how is that person that you asked me to pray for? It's not a spiritual issue for us. It's not on the spiritual agenda at all. And this is actually reflected in preaching. Over 50% of the Christians that we have surveyed have never heard a sermon on work. Not one. 
Over 75% have never been taught a theology of work, and less than a quarter have ever been encouraged in any way to consider their workplace as a context for ministry. I think it, it is perpetuated uh, and has reached this very serious point and place because uh, those responsible for the teaching ministry of local churches do not have any clue what's going on in, in the workplace. But, but the, the realities of the workplace are light years away from the realities of running a local church. A massive national study reveals that the majority of Christians get no significant support whatsoever for the way that we, the way that you, spend 60, 70 percent of your waking lives. We labour with the unconscious belief that all Christians are born equal, but that full-time Christians are more equal than others. We have a kind of holy hierarchy with the pastor at the top bathed in halonic light, and below the pastor a missionary, as long as they're overseas. When they come back with those dreadful slides, well then they fall off the chart, don't they? And below missionaries we have people called tent makers. This is a very interesting category. A tent maker is somebody with a so-called secular skill a secretary, a midwife, somebody who's an engineer, an oil rig person, somebody who takes that secular skill as a Christian into a country where you can only get into that country with that skill. Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, all kinds of countries like that. In fact, a third of the world, you can only get in as a Christian if you have that kind of a skill. But what are you if you go to uh, Riyadh and work for Kodak in Saudi Arabia? What are you then? Well, then you're a very holy person. But what are you? if you work for Kodak in Harrow? Well, what many people feel is they're just walking checkbooks. They're there to bankroll the church. And of course, that's a very significant ministry. But is that all they are? No. Wherever you are, if you're a tent maker, you're a significant player in the kingdom of God. And below tent makers, if you have them, you have elders, and they're slightly holier than deacons, who are slightly holier than church members, who are slightly holier than poor Christians, who are slightly holier than ordinary Christians, who are slightly holier than rich Christians, because if there's one thing we do have a problem with, and that's money. And of course, everybody's holier than former advertising executives. Yes. Let me tell you about Stephen. He's a, a guy who works as director of communications for Tear Fund. It's an organization that takes the good news to the poor all over the world. Well, Stephen, before he worked for Tear Fund, used to be a teacher in an inner city school. And in that school, about 50% of the pupils were from Muslim or Hindu backgrounds. A tough school, a difficult place for a Christian to work, really. And as far as he knew, the church, the church that he was in at the time, never prayed for him in his role as a teacher in that school. Never. Now, it may be that one or two individuals did, but he was never on the official church prayer list. Well, when uh, Stephen went off to Tear Fund, working with about 100 evangelicals every day, talking to evangelicals in the corridors, ringing up evangelicals on the phone, sometimes getting on airplanes to go overseas and talk to other evangelical Christians, suddenly... Stephen was on everybody's prayer list. Suddenly, the church officially was praying for Stephen. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it, that they should pray for Stephen in that job? But why weren't they praying for him before? Which job was really more important in God's eyes? Well, actually, neither. Both were equally important. So why did Stephen get prayer support in the one context and not in the other? But wherever one goes, we've got this, this talk which actually reflects a conviction which actually expresses a, a heresy that ministry is getting ordained or doing full-time youth work or, or, or whatever. I suspect we no longer have a theology of vocation. Your work matters to God. It matters to God not just as a means of provision, not just as a means of supporting church work, not just as a platform for evangelism and a platform for ministry. It matters in itself, whatever it is. Work as bed maker, home maker, car maker, deal maker. Your work matters to God. I suspect again that we don't really believe that fantastic verse of scripture which Paul writes to Timothy in his second letter, 2 Timothy 3.16, where he's, he writes this, all scripture, all scripture, the whole word of God is inspired by God. It's God-breathed and it's beneficial. It's profitable. For what? It's profitable for training, for rebuking, for correcting, for teaching, so that the person of God may be equipped for every good work. As Christians, we do need good teaching to work in a secular environment, because many secular environments, well, their worldview is entirely antithetical to a biblical worldview. As Christians, we need good biblical teaching to deal with some of the very difficult issues that we face in the workplace. 
business issues, issues in the NHS, issues to do with finance, issues for lawyers, issues for teachers, issues for all kinds of people, issues that often we don't talk to one another about, so we don't feel confident, that we don't feel we have a biblical answer. We need to talk to one another and to work out the answers. The message is, is loud and clear that um, uh, not only are people um, feeling alienated from active involvement in the life of the church for the reasons we've mentioned, um, but uh, they find it very difficult actually to go and sit down with their pastor and tell them that, and tell them on top of that what they would love to see um, being provided by the local church. Uh, so I think, first of all, I would encourage pastors to sit down with the people and the people to sit down with the pastors and really talk it out so that, and I think it would mean for pastors spending not just that kind of time, but taking time out to go and see what people are involved with in their daily um, working lives. And we also need to pray, don't we? We need to pray together, friends together, spouses together, co-workers together, home groups together, the church. We need to pray about these issues and we need to pray for people in the workplace. Not simply the obvious people, you know, doctors and nurses, and if you're in a left-wing church, social workers, but for other people, lawyers and bricklayers and managers. A while back I was sitting in my home group, um, I don't need it, somebody else leaves it, I'm sitting, sitting there looking around the room, thinking I've been, been with these people now for six, seven years, and I've written a book on, you know, ministry in the workplace. And I'm looking around the room, I'm thinking, do I know the name of anybody that anybody in this room works with? Do I know the name of Kevin's boss, or so-and-so's boss, or Wendy's boss, or David's co-workers? And I suddenly realized I didn't know the name of one person that anybody in the room worked with. What an extraordinary thing, really, how hard it is to put prayer on the agenda. And then I contrasted that with, uh, with my friend Stephen. My friend Stephen works for Jews for Jesus in Paris, and every three months or so he sends me a newsletter. And on this newsletter, there are names of people most of these names, he works in France, most of these names I cannot actually even pronounce. And there are names of people that he expects me to pray for by name. Interesting, isn't it? Well, on the one hand, there's a person I see very rarely asking me to pray for people by name who I will never meet. And on the other hand, here are these people that I meet once, twice a week, and I don't know the name of one person that they work with. Are we going to our pastor and asking them to teach us about work, about vocation, about leisure, about play, about rest? Are we asking them to help us deal with promotion and disappointment and failure? Are we saying to them, How, you know, help us now, help us with these problems of, of honesty and integrity that we face in the workplace. Help us deal with the stress. Or are we simply writing them off? We're saying, well, they haven't done a day's work for years, so they won't understand. They haven't been there recently, so they don't know what it's like. Let's not write them off. Let's, let's work together. I think any person in the workplace who feels the draft and feels the, the uh, temptation to sort of not relate their faith to their work because they don't feel competent to do it, any such Christian must sit down with their local pastor, vicar, whatever it is, curate, uh, and, and um, speak from the heart. and uh, uh, and. Uh, that only has to happen three or four times for, for the guy to get the message or the woman pastor to get the message. When you go to work, your essential identity does not change. You're still an ambassador for Christ, charged with a message of reconciliation. You're still a son or daughter of the king, a prince or princess. Christ is still in you. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the old has passed away. Lo, behold, wow, the new has come. I think the first thing that any Christian needs to be aware of uh, as they go to work is the recognition that Jesus Christ is not only with me as I go, but is there to welcome me as I arrive. I know someone, or I've heard of someone to be accurate, who as they step on the carpet which opens the door automatically as they go into their building, says, good morning, Lord. In other words, that person believes that Jesus is there all the time before they ever get there. Whereas most of us who are evangelicals tend to think that we're the ones who bring Christ into the workplace. Now, uh, I think it would change our whole mood and demeanor and, and attitude, not only to ourselves and our responsibilities and our opportunities, but also to what Jesus may well be doing in people, because he is already there and he is Lord of that place. We still, you still have access 
to all of God's resources, to his word, to his spirit, to his sovereign power and intervention, and to the prayers and support of his people. But do we take advantage of it at work? What is, what is Jesus doing in this situation? How is he at work in my colleagues? You know, how can I notice him sort of um, already um, working himself? I'm working here, but he's working here too. Now, how is he working? What is he doing in people? How is he prodding people? How is he convicting people? How is he opening people up? And, and uh, so that, so that uh, uh, it would be great if every Christian was sort of Christ-sensitive uh, in the workplace in terms of not how can I witness, but what is Jesus doing here? Uh, and that see, see their witness as dovetailing in with what God is doing. It's the old sort of, if you like, the old Wimber thing, you know, see what the Father is doing and get in with that. I think it's a very important re reconnection with the Lordship of Christ in the workplace. God's identity doesn't change at work, and nor does yours. But do we really believe that? Do we really believe that the Holy Spirit is the same here, there, and indeed also in the workplace? Don't we really believe that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Mission, actually arrives at the uh, factory gate and says, whoops, here we are at the factory gate. See you later at the prayer meeting. Don't we really believe that uh, when we arrive at the office door, the Holy Spirit says, well, here we are at the office door. Let's forget, let's forget the evangelism bit. Let's forget the gifts of the Spirit. They're controversial enough in the church. Let's just concentrate on the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Well, of course, of course the Holy Spirit will work on our character at work. But is that all he's interested in? No, of course not. The Holy Spirit is always yearning to point people towards Jesus, to bring glory to the Father. So the workplace is really important in God's eyes. It's not some little sideline. It's part of the main action. And it's also a fantastic context for ministry. And as we'll see in the next talk, for evangelism as well. Mm -hmm.